Yeah, sending this one out to my evolutionary psychology people. Yeah, David Buss, Cosmides and Tubi. Yeah, Jeffrey Miller. Yeah, we live in this till the day that we die. Survival of the fit, only the strong survive. There's a war going on outside, no man is safe from You can run, but you can't hide forever You come to my block, you'll see some territoriality A place where a killer be killed is the mentality But get it straight, it's just a necessary strategy You gotta play the hand you dealt You can't magically escape from the habitat that you was born in Three homicides in my neighborhood this morning Cops came and kicked the crooked door in with no warning And started roughing up my young cousin She's only 17 and got a bun in the oven plus a concussion But she ain't done nothing so keep your mouth shut and don't jump to judgment on the lies we're living just close your eyes and listen while i break down some homicide statistics so if you're thinking the criminal mind is just vacant you're mistaken this is calculated risk taking we living in a situation with the low life expectancy and a major discrepancy between the haves and the have-nots and you wonder why the padlock on every cash box is smashed off come on you can't call it pathological nah that's illogical you can try to understand it but you can't stop it though Not not unless you address the root causes The conscious and unconscious decisions To discount future prospects Come on, it's obvious the beat keeps bouncing The homicide rate keeps mounting Which leads to steep discounting And a lot of violence, but it's not a virus It's a rational response to high risk environments And short time horizons with high stakes And highly visible prizes And you wonder why we're criminal minded? Hey, you can't say we'll get satisfaction If we're patient with self control And delayed gratification when the only job that pays his cask and bacon and death is the ultimate plan cancellation so check the facts and recent data releasing it shows a pattern of increasing competition a bunch of young guys all struggling and status seeking and causing the crimes that make the social fabric weaken and life expectancy also predicts teen pregnancy the need to leave a legacy genetically will never be completely controlled contraceptively yeah that's transparent imagine if your kids would never meet their grandparents unless they followed the bristol palin plan for parenthood and then they say Ooh, these young girls are so damn careless Getting pregnant before marriage is such a tragedy Apparently it's also a reproductive strategy Especially when you can see them adjusting actively when their circumstances change In both the cases of the young ladies with babies and the male risk takers We see people adapting to their situations And it's the same in different places and with different races This is not about ethical justifications It's evolutionary psych and it's just the basics And still people call this behavior maladaptive Because of our reaction when violence happens but if we really want to change the outcome Then maybe we should just start questioning how it's adaptive And the bottom line is that iniquity and life expectancy Are the ultimate causes of crime And the results of crime, to me that's true The two combine together in a feedback loop But I got some moves to make now, so I'll be back soon Just don't ask me what I'm about to do Right, cause I can't say, so it's left the untold fact Until my death, my ghost will stay alive Survival of the fit, only the strong survive That's right, we live in this till the day that we die Survival of the fit, only the strong survive Yeah, we live in this till the day that we die Survival of the fit, only the strong survive That's right, we live in this till the day that we die Survival of the fit, only the strong survive Yeah, we live in this till the day that we die Survival of the fit, only the strong survive That's right, we live in this till the day that we die Survival of the fit, only the strong Only the strong Only the strong only the strong, yeah. Sending this out to all my evolutionary psychologists Daly and Wilson, Steven Pinker, Robert Wright, yeah. David Sloan Wilson, yeah. That's right, gather the evidence, make it real, make it real. Human mentality, represent, yeah. This is human nature, human nature to the core. I'ma get mine and you get yours. Don't question my actions <laughs> Unless you're ready to make a little addition Before I make a subtraction <laughs> End you up in traction That's right Love scrapping <laughs> Peace I'm here talking today with Dr. Martin Daly. 
Dr. Daly is a professor of psychology at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, and author of many influential papers on evolutionary psychology. His current research topics include an evolutionary perspective on risk-taking and interpersonal violence, especially male-male conflict and family. He and his wife, the late Margot Wilson, were the former editors-in-chief of the journal Evolution and Human Behavior and former presidents of the Human Behavior and Evolution Society. He was named a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada in 1998. Daly is one of the main researchers of the Cinderella effect and has been interviewed many times in the press about it. So I'm very pleased to be talking with Dr. Daly this morning. It seems to me that he's one of Canada's most outstanding psychologists and perhaps you could say that about psychologists in the world. And he's done some incredibly interesting research on the relationship between inequality and male violence and, and inequality and other topics too. So. Welcome, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Jordan. It's nice to be talking to you. Well, I'm looking forward to our conversation a lot. So, you just wrote a book, which I'm going to show people, called Killing the Competition. And uh, I just read it. It was very interesting. So, I thought maybe I could get you to start by talking a little bit about the book and, and also how you... Tell us tell us the story. That would be the, the good a good thing to do. Well, the general issue um, that is addressed in the book is the relationship between economic inequality, which is usually indexed as income inequality, and homicide rates. And it's been known for a long time by sociologists that income inequality is the single best predictor they've got of homicide rates across countries, across states within the U.S., across cities within the U.S., and some other kinds of jurisdictional comparisons. And there's been controversy about why that is and whether inequality itself is truly the problem or whether it's just a correlate of something else. And in this book, I try to make the case that no, inequality really is the problem and some of the arguments that have been advanced for suggesting that it's a mere correlate of violence rather than in some way causal to violence are wrong. So can you tell us a little bit about how you calculate inequality and, and what the measure is? Yeah, income inequality, um, there's a number of different measures that are used by economists, and I'm just borrowing the dominant ones from economists. The number one one is something called the Gini Index, G-I-N-I. I used to assume that that was some kind of uh, acronym, but actually it was the name of an Italian economist. And it's a measure that is ranges from zero to one. It would be zero if everybody had exactly the same income or exactly the same wealth if you're doing wealth inequality. And it would approach one as income or wealth was concentrated more and more in the hands of few and then a single individual. And in principle would go to one in the extreme if all wealth were held by Bill Gates and none of the rest of us had anything. And now you analyze the, the Gini coefficient at different levels of, of jurisdiction. Eh? So. I noted in your work that you've looked at countries and states uh, within countries, and I think that's particularly true in the U.S. So tell us a little bit about what you found. Yeah, well, with within the U.S., and again, this has been known by sociologists um, for some time, within the U.S. and cross-nationally, um, the Gini coefficient is a very good predictor of homicide. The correlation tends to be on the order of 0.7 in many studies, which means that the variance in either measure, 50% of it could be accounted for by the variability in the other measure, um, what I'm saying between homicide and income inequality. And actually, um, it even works on a neighborhood level. My late wife, Margot, and I published some analyses in Chicago that showed that income inequality was a very strong predictor of homicide rates across neighborhoods within Chicago. Tell us a little bit about what you did in Chicago, because that, that research is extremely interesting, and also when you did it. Um, Let's see, we did our work in Chicago in the early 90s, and at that time, um, Chicago had a very high homicide rate, not the worst in the United States, but one of the worst in the United States, and in fact had more homicides every year than the whole of Canada, which makes it a substantial enough phenomenon that you can sort of look for causal factors or correlates without a lot of stochastic noise. Um, 
in Chicago, Chicago is divided up into some 77, I believe, neighborhoods uh, by there's a long-standing tradition of urban sociology in Chicago, and there's these sort of well-recognized 77 neighborhoods. And anyway, for these neighborhoods, we were able to amass a variety of neighborhood-specific information, including on income distributions, on homicides, and so forth, um, working with the Chicago police, who were collaborators in some of this work. And Margot um, went to the Illinois Department of Health to try and get information on other death rates and birth rates and demographic structure of each of the neighborhoods. And she wanted to compute the life expectancy because the idea that she had was that local life expectancy would affect the extent to which people were willing to sort of escalate dangerously in competitive situations. In competitive, and that was our construal of what most homicides in Chicago were about, were guys killing each other when dissed in bars, um, circumstances in which there's some sort of competition and it gets dangerous. And our basic idea there and elsewhere has been that a lot of the variability in homicide rates, the most violent, volatile component of homicide rates, has to do with this male-male competition and where, where and when does it get dangerous and where or when does it sort of dampen down. And for Chicago, anyway, the Illinois Department of Health had never, nobody had ever computed neighborhood specific life expectancy, but the data were available to do it, age specific mortality and so on was available to do it. And so we computed age specific life expectancies, income inequality, and many other variables that uh, criminologists have considered relevant in past studies, racial heterogeneity and blah, blah, blah. And tried to see what were your best predictors of homicide. And in that particular study, everywhere else we've worked, we've mostly found income inequality to be number one. In that particular study, income inequality was a very good predictor, but the best predictor was male life expectancy um, at age at birth or at age 15. And in order to compute, like, of course you say homicide rates, homicide reduces male life expectancy. So you have to remove homicide statistically as a cause of death and say life expectancy net of the impact of homicide, that was our best predictor of homicide rates. So life expectancy is very variable in the city of Chicago and I assume in other US cities. I mean, in the worst neighborhoods, male life expectancy at birth was down in the 50s as bad as in the worst countries in the world. In the best neighborhoods, male life expectancy was up in the, I think was over 80 um, or in the high 70s in any case. Um, corresponding to what you might expect in Scandinavia or the places with the best life expectancy in the world. So it's a huge range. That was our best predictor. Then if you try and do a multivariate analysis where you look for, well, what else predicts some the residual variability? And there wasn't much residual variability. The second best, indeed the only secondary predictor that seemed to be statistically significant was income inequality across the neighborhoods. That was that was the thrust of our, our study in Chicago. And I'd love to see more work on life expectancy as a predictor of violence. Um, uh, Université de Montréal uh, criminologist Marc Wimet tried to do the same thing in, in Montreal, but he found that in Montreal, the difference in life expectancy for men between the worst and the best neighborhoods was only six years, whereas in Chicago it was 24 four years, I think. So, so what, do you, uh, what do you think accounted for the vast difference in life expectancy between Chicago and Montreal? And was life expectancy itself associated with income inequality? Oh, yes. I mean, that's part of the problem, of course, in all this kind of research here. It's not experimental research. You don't control independent variables and everything of potential interest is correlated with everything else. So, you know, income inequality alone accounts for more than half the variance in homicide rates across Chicago neighborhoods. So does life expectancy alone. Um, so does percent below the poverty line alone. Um, you know, but right. these things are all correlated with each other. And so trying to tease apart what's most important is tricky. Well, so, um, so the, 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 low, the low life expectancy in Chicago neighborhoods is not due to violence. It's due to it's it's due overwhelmingly to differential disease. Um, in Chicago, you know, privatization of medicine in the U.S. was so extreme that at the time we were doing this research, emergency rooms in the worst neighborhoods in Chicago had closed down because they'd gone bankrupt. Um, they didn't have enough money to remain open, and therefore, if you got stabbed or shot in a bad neighborhood in Chicago, you had to be 
transported somewhere else to try and keep you alive because there was, you know, the hospitals had shut their emergency rooms um, or had shut down completely. So there's all sorts of factors that contribute to, uh, to differential death rates. But, you know, kids in the worst neighborhood are exposed to high levels of lead. Um, there's some evidence that lead exposure in childhood is a big predictor of um, variability in life expectancy. Um, all kinds of internal diseases they were more susceptible to. The effects of bad nutrition they were more susceptible to. So if you, if you divide causes of death into so-called external causes, which basically means homicides, suicides, and accidents, and internal causes, which is more or less synonymous with what we ordinarily think of as disease, Internal causes were still the biggest source of differential mortality across neighborhoods. So you could make, by the sounds of it, you could make a reasonable case that the social safety net in Canada is flattening out the bottom of the, of the income distribution, especially the provision of health care. And you know, I also re um, was informed a while back uh, that the rate of entrepreneurship in Canada is actually higher than in than in the US and part of the reason for that is that because health care is provided people can take a risk of walking away from their jobs without putting their family completely at risk and so one of the perverse effects of socialized medicine is that it elevates the rates of entrepreneurship so I also wanted to mention you know your your work was absolutely striking to me because of the effect sizes now it, for people who don't know about uh, how, how to compare effect sizes I should point out that you never see a correlation of 0.7 between any two variables in the social sciences. So there's a guy named Hemphill who did an empirical analysis of effect size comparisons uh, about four or five years ago. It might be longer than that now. And he concluded that 95% of social science studies had an uh, effect size of 0.5 or less. And so to see a correlation of 0.7 is absolutely overwhelming when you also take into account that measurement error is decreasing the, the potency of the relationship to some degree. So that's the and when you take into account that uh, that those uh, th that point five represents studies that were published because they got something. Yes, exactly, exactly. So so point seven is absolutely overwhelming. I've never seen effect sizes that big between two variables of interest in any other domain that I can recall. And then the other thing that, that's worth pointing out, and, and we can talk about this a little bit too, is the other thing that's so radical about your research is that it and and this this what emerges out of the out of the manner in which the Gini coefficient is is calculated because it's only a measure of relative poverty um, and it's the predictor you you also generated data indicating that places where everyone was relatively poor or say relatively working class like North Dakota and some of the Canadian provinces had very low homicide rates and also places where everyone was rich Right, so to re reiterate, what you're seeing is that what's driving male homicide is the existence, and for, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the existence of a steep economic dominance hierarchy that makes it difficult for the young men to obtain status through what you might describe as conventional and socially productive means. And so instead they turn to violence as a means of establishing status. And most of that's within race and between young men jockeying for position. Is that all correct? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a pretty fair characterization. Um, it's, it's worth stressing, yes, that income inequality is in principle and in practice dissociable from just average income or, or percent below the poverty line or other measures of so-called absolute uh, deprivation. They're often correlated. Um, right. You know, income inequality across a certain set of jurisdictions may be fairly strongly correlated with um, the percent below the poverty line, for example, would be surprising if it was not usually correlated. But uh, but they're not necessarily, as you said. Yeah, so you demonstrated, or you were one of the first people to demonstrate, were you the first, in fact, maybe, that it wasn't poverty that was causing this kind of crime, it was relative poverty. And that, that changes the interpretation of the situation absolutely dramatically. So tell us a little bit about why you think the males are competing in, in this deadly manner? What's driving that behavior? Well, it's very interesting. I think, I think men are sensitive to, are interested in relative position, status, um, maintaining face in competitive milieus. And you know, in a sense, all milieus are a bit competitive. Um, and the willingness to use violence partly 
can be thought of as kind of a disdain for the future or I want mine now. Um, I'm willing to do something that threatens my life, like escalate in competition or not back down or not walk away from an insult. Um, because I'm, I'm thinking very short term, um, the rewards for for being passive, you know, if, you, if you're if you're a nice, um, prosperous university student of age 20, you have good life prospects, your chances for eventually becoming well paid, um, maybe people will laugh at this are still reasonably good, your chances for eventually marrying are still reasonably good. If you're the same age kind of guy um, in a urban ghetto with a 48% unemployment rate or something like that, then you have very much more, and, and with uncertainty about the stability of whatever income you do get with, with um, the future unknown, then you're more willing to take a risk now in the pursuit of status now, in the pursuit of sexual opportunity now, in the pursuit of monetary rewards, legal or illicit now. And also the maintenance of face, like social reputation is the one resource you've got if you've got other resources, you can walk away from threats or or disrespect um, and and reap your rewards later. If social status is all you've got, then it becomes an important thing to defend. So I read some research a while back that looked at the relationship between socioeconomic status among men and number of sexual partners and also socioeconomic status among women and number of sexual partners and that's another domain where you see these kinds of whopping correlations so the correlation between socioeconomic status for men and number of available sexual partners is about 0.6 or 0.7 whereas for women it's negative 0.12 and so do you think so do you think that it's reasonable to assume that either at the phylogenetic level, level or the ontogenetic level, e either evolutionarily speaking or even as a consequence of rational calculation, that part of the reason that men, or perhaps the main reason that men are engaging in these status competitions is because of female hypergamy? Is that, um, a, reasonable, is that a reasonable hypothesis? Hypergamy, and as you say, si um, simple access. I mean, there, there is... There, the, the association that you mentioned is presumably a very long-standing one. That is to say that men of, with status and resources have had access to partners for sure and probably multiple partners simultaneously or serially um, to a degree that men of lower status have not. There's high variance in eventual reproduction among males in mammals generally and although the situation is less extreme in people than in many other mammals. The same is true for people. I mean, when you say they have high variance compared to what? Well, high variance compared to women, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the variability in eventual reproductive success is lower for women than for men and, or has been. Now, you say s sexual access to women, and I think that's exactly the right level to be looking at in contemporary societies. But the reason why that matters is because ancestrally that translated into differential reproduction right. in a modern environment in which you know contraceptive technology is available especially to women then uh, that that correlation may be broken down but the motives to seek sexual opportunity um, remain relevant so one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about too is the like you 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 made a comment in your book about Adrian Raines, and Adrian Raines has written a book recently about the biological predictors of criminality, and you make a strong case that, in in some sense, the 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 turning to violence that's characteristic of men in uncertain situations, is rational, because it drives it actually legitimately drives status increase, and that produces a yeah. variety of positive effects. So. It, in some sense, it's a rational response to a radically uncertain environment where competition is high. Now, Reigns would say, and the biological type researchers, they, they, look at, they look more at the individual level and conclude that it's individuals who have various forms of prefrontal damage or, or characterological issues um, associated with antisocial personality disorder that are more likely to engage in violent acts. And you can track that. I mean, Richard Trombley has done some of this work in Quebec. You can track 
the emergence of aggression at an individual level all the way back to children at two years of age because it turns out that children who are two are the most violent children particularly the boys but mostly a subset of boys who who kick fight hit and bite and steal at two most of whom are socialized by the age of four but a subset of whom are not socialized and then they become they're more likely to become the lifetime offenders and and so what i'm wondering is maybe you can reconcile the difference between the two research um, streams like this imagine that as the economic gradient increases and the dominance hierarchy becomes steeper and steeper the men who are prone to be violent um, like, like it's the disagreeable men that start to be violent first maybe yeah. the ones that have an impulse control problem or that are characterologically like like the violent two-year-olds that are characterologically predisposed to be violent it seems to me that those would be the ones that you know as the pressure increases those men who are more prone to violence for other reasons are going to be the f people who react with violence first. Do you think that's a reasonable hypothesis? Yeah, no, I think that's a very reasonable hypothesis. And I mean, my objection to Adrian Raid's book was um, that I think he vast, you know, he, he's, there's definitely evidence that many kinds of uh, violent criminal offenders have got something wrong with their brains. Adrian Ray wants to extrapolate to the conclusion that violent criminals, and indeed criminals in general, have got something broken about their brains. And it's like criminality is pathological. Well, criminality is not pathological. People steal for cost-benefit related reasons. Um, the crime is a if you like, God help us, social construction in the sense that um, certain behaviors are criminalized by a larger social group in order to deter them because self-interested individuals would otherwise pursue them. You know, how do you make people stop exploiting others, stealing from others um, by criminalizing those activities and imposing penalties? And, you know, there's a rational choice of um, stream of theorizing within criminology that that other people like Adrian Ray just dismiss out of hand. No, no, criminal offenses are pathological. Yeah. And, and I think that's silly. Well, it seems unnecessary, you know, that, because it isn't yes. that difficult to make a marriage between the two issues. Like one of the best predictors, you know, I do research on individual differences in personality and the best personality predictor of incarceration is low agreeableness. And that's yeah. one of the dimensions on which men and women differ the most. And so, as you become more disagreeable, you become more self-oriented, I would say, and that can push past the point where you're so self-interested that you're willing to prey on others. And so those are the guys that, as well as the guys who lack impulse control, those are the guys, the first guys to turn to violence, let's say, when the socioeconomic conditions become sufficiently unstable so that a conscientious approach is not tenable. Yeah, and, and still... And the marriage between that kind of thinking and and thinking about the relevance of inequality is that there's guys at the top who are like the violent people you describe. There's people doing very well who are very happy to exploit others. But the costs of individual violent action are high enough and the opportunities to exploit other people through financial means, through your lawyers, um, through whatever tactics are available to, you know, well-heeled bullies are are safe enough that they opt to, to behave in those directions right because they've got a they, they, their long-term future is relatively stable and so that long-term planning and regulation of behavior actually play a, an important economic role and and you know and then in, in the case of somebody like donald trump i mean he looks like somebody who's suffering a little bit of an impulse control problem especially sort of during the night when he wakes up and his his Twitter account is too close at hand, but he's he's rich enough to bully people in other ways that actually hands on violence. Although, come to think of it, uh, the famous remark that he made during the campaign about women um, suggests perhaps that you know it depends on your definition of hands on violence. I guess that qualifies. Okay, so. Um there's a very large body of research that indicates that alcohol is a major contributor to criminality too, especially with regards to men. Um, and so about 50% of people who are murdered have a decent blood alcohol level and about 50% of murderers. And I think that's partly, that stat 
is equal equalizes i think because much violence among men is exactly the sort that you describe where it's a status dispute and it's more or less a toss up who's going to come out as a winner but then i guess what's happening with alcohol perhaps is that because it's a disinhibitor because it reduces anxiety and, and anxiety is one of the suppressors of aggressive behavior that men who are already on the edge let's say because of the unstable environment and the steep dominance hierarchy are also more likely to lose control when they're drinking and maybe that's also fueled this is something too that i'm curious about i mean you can think about it as a rational calculation but but i'm also curious about the degree to which it's fueled by emergent negative emotions so it's yeah. easy for people who are in uh steep dominance hierarchies to regard the system as unfair and to become resentful and, and angry about it as, as perhaps they should be i'm not suggesting that that's necessarily an irrational response but it, it seems that if the anger is simmering underneath the surface that it's waiting in some sense for an opportunity to break free and alcohol in a bar or at home perhaps provides that 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 route yeah I, I, what you say makes evident sense to me i mean it's probably worth injecting a bit of a caution about the word rationality generally when one talks about um rationality in crime but perhaps especially in confrontational violence the point is not that the person is making good and carefully weighed decisions. I mean, I think, you know, emotions are the handmaiden of what I would call ecological rationality. They, they help you know how you should feel about certain things and how you should react to them. And the rationality claim is more a claim of this person gets riled up, resents X, and, there, and he should. There's good reason to get riled up and resent X. But the fact that alcohol perhaps disinhibits so that, you know, the, the truly rational balance between inhibitory and aggressive emotions is altered. The idea that, ration, that alcohol um, interferes with, with cognitive processes to the point that people are, start making stupid decisions when they're drunk, um, right. decide to get behind the wheel or whatever. I think this plays very heavily into the reason why so many homicides tend to happen in contexts like two drunks insulting each other and or you know people who are somewhat under the influence of alcohol insulting each other rather than uh, you know if you if you have more if you have more mental wherewithal at the moment you probably have better capacities to confuse da to to defuse dangerous situations through um, you know ways that don't entail losing face by by being articulate um great exactly that's right you have other tools at your disposal rather than immediate recourse to your fists thank you yes <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if i remember correctly too in your chicago studies this is one of the things that i found particularly fascinating was you track the consequences of killing someone in chicago and the consequences were something of the following sort. Well, first of all, you were likely to be charged with something like second degree murder. It would be difficult for the police to find people to testify against you. And if they did, generally what they would say is that it was a two way altercation. And so in many cases, you could plead self defense. Often it didn't go before a jury because the perpetrator plea bargained it down to manslaughter the sentence was something on the on the order of a couple of years and people were generally out of prison in 18 months with a substantial boost in their social capital because now they were like dangerous sons of bitches not to be messed with and that was quite clear and also perhaps also improved so to speak by their sojourn in prison is that is if i got that right um except for one detail well Actually, in our Chicago studies, we didn't have as good follow-up information as what you're talking about. This this was an earlier piece of research in the city of Detroit that uh, wow. that led to most of those findings. But uh, but yeah, exactly. Um, hardly it, it's interesting. We had a we had a single year sample of cases in Detroit, and there were I think 590 homicides in Detroit in that one year, 1972, at which time Detroit did have the highest homicide rate in the U.S. A, a large majority of these are male-male disputes of some sort, um, status disputes usually, but sometimes robberies. And just as you said, um, witnesses are unlikely to come forward, and the prosecutors are stretched. They don't have... Right.
They don't have um, the resources that they would need to pursue every case. And so they many cases were dismissed. I mean, not even prosecuted, never by plea bargain. Something like approximately half of all male, male, macho dispute homicides in Detroit that were solved were not prosecuted on the expectation that there was a plausible self-defense argument that might, mm -hmm. you know, win with a jury. Then of the half that were prosecuted, almost all of them, yeah, were plea bargained down to manslaughter, and the majority of them got a conviction. It's right, it's three years, 50% time off for good behavior. If you behave nicely, you go to Jackson State Prison in Michigan. Um, 18 months later, you're back out on the streets of Detroit. And Margot in particular was very interested in the question of whether killing in these contexts might even actually ultimately pay off for guys. I tend to the view that actually killing is, an, is overstepping the bounds of utility. Um, that, that, That's deadly, reassuring. that deadly threats are very self-interested and effectual. But that when you, but, but that actually following through on them is maybe be, you know the the non-functional tip of the iceberg. But I honestly don't know that that's true in these kind of cases for the, for exactly this reason that um, guys get some social capital out of having yeah. done it. Well, hypothetically, among the Yanomamo, the, the tribe tribes in 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 South America and South America, I believe, or Central, I think it's South America. South America, yeah, yeah. yeah. The the more warlike men have a much higher uh, reproduction rate, the ones who've killed more. Now, I don't know, obviously, it isn't necessarily the case that that's directly translatable, but there is some utility in being a successful warrior. It's, that's actually one of the reasons that I think that, that capitalism, so to speak, is underappreciated, because in, in, in a very, I'm speaking in a very specific sense, is that there are disagreeable and warlike men um, and some of them are very powerful in many ways, not only physically, but intellectually and characterologically and, and with, with great ambition. And the thing about capitalism is that it enables them to wage war in a manner that's, that's not deadly and to become successful that way and, and to channel their, their, their in, intense competitive energy into something that, well, I think it often is often for a social good. Now, it depends on how disagreeable the person is and how selfish they are, of course, but people like that also tend to get punished in their in their cooperative interactions with other people. Yeah, I, I mean, I partly agree, but I also feel that the often toward the social good is a bit hopeful. I mean, um, to the degree that people are successful in a fairly unrestrained capitalist um, competition, it's usually at the expense of large numbers of um, people at the bottom. But it depends how unrestrained that capitalist competition yeah, well, is. I was thinking of social good as in better than war. Yeah, you know, better you than know, war for right, sure. Right, better than that, war for sure. And sometimes, and sometimes the way you succeed is by producing goods that actually make people's lives better. Um, no quarrel with that. So now I also wanted to ask you, I, in the last couple of chapters of your book, you turned to what I would regard as more political issues. And so I... I and I am I'm very interested in inequality because we'll recapitulate for a minute. So your work and the work of other people seems to indicate that as inequality increases and dominance hierarchies get steeper, not only do young men get more violent and so society becomes less stable, but there's also detrimental impacts on things like population health and 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 that are and that was that was documented quite nicely in the spirit level. And so I'm going to. Uh, address a couple of criticisms of the research and and then I want to ask you I want to have a discussion about your your more prescriptive views if that's okay so yeah. so the first issue someone just emailed me this a while back and when I was talking about inequality and they said well what about places like China where the rates of inequality are starting to skyrocket quite substantially and have been for you know several years maybe maybe several decades yet the the homicide rate doesn't seem to be budging much. And so I thought, well, that was interesting. Maybe there's something different about East Asian communities. Uh, they tend to have very low crime rates to begin with, uh, like places like Japan, for example, have very low crime rates. And so I'm wondering if what you think about that, is that a reasonable criticism and, and how would you address it? Fair enough. Um, well, I don't, I don't think we can characterize 
you know, Orientals as less violent than Occidentals or anything like that. I think, you know, history tells us otherwise that uh, there's been a lot of severe and dangerous violence in Japan in history and in China in history. I don't know how good data we have on Chinese homicide rates, but what I've seen is that they have been going up a bit lately. Um, but still, the point that inequality has been skyrocketing. I mean, partly, there's an interesting question about time lags and mm-hmm. the effects of, right. on people. You know, how, how soon is an increased inequality effect going to play out as nasty interpersonal behavior? Um, and... You know, people respond to inequality as a result of their lifetime experiences. You know, you were talking about young kids, already very young children, already being predictable in the extent to which they're willing to, you know, use violent tactics against other people. And that, you know, assaying three and four year olds could give you some surprisingly good prediction of how they'll behave as adults. It's not inconceivable that the effects of inequality even are influencing people's development prenatally. Uh, and so, you know, the uterine environments that they experience as a function of, of inequitable environments and the stresses and fraught social comparisons and so on that happen in those environments could be influencing them at all life stages. So I don't think we have any strong basis for expecting rapid change in inequality to be accompanied in the short term by rapid change in violence. Um, that said, there, you know, it's certainly the case that there's other things that matter. And... Government controls are one. Um, I think I think strong governments that monopolize the legitimate use of violence can keep a lid on violence for a long time. Um, I, you know, I I would question whether they can keep a lid on it indefinitely, but they could keep a lid on it for a long time. If you if you execute all charged murderers. Um, I presume that that would keep the incidents of murder down, and not only because those people could be recidivists. Right. So, so there's an element potentially of authoritarian control. Yeah. And then the other I element think so. that I think is 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 particularly interesting is the time lag argument. I mean, we, you don't know over what period of time precisely inequality has its pernicious effects, and maybe it's not even the span of one lifetime. I mean, do do you have any data on that 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 would help help answer the question? Well, I did I did make reference um, in my book, Killing the Competition, to one sociological study that was looking at effects of inequality on mortality generally, and the notion that inequality affects mortality generally yeah. is mediated by what you were talking about about health effects. The idea that um, you know stresses and fraught social comparisons produce um, greater vulnerability to stress-related diseases, and, and in fact, many diseases, most diseases maybe even are stress-related in their ultimate impacts on people. Um, so there's this one sociological study uh, by a guy named Zheng in Ohio State, which sought effects of economic inequality on mortality in general, and came to the conclusion that there, the, the effects were lagged, that the maximum impact on current mortality was inequality seven years ago, which sounds kind of funny, but he had analyses which seemed to show, and, and I'm, I'm a bit wary about the legitimacy of these analyses, but they seemed to me to show, they seemed to show to him that inequality of a few years ago affects the chance that you'll die now, um, net of the effects of, you know, age and sex and, and other predictors of mortality, and that there's sort of the cumulative consequences of many years of, immort- of of past inequality. So seven years ago was the worst, but six and eight also mattered additively. Five years ago and nine years ago also mattered additively. Ten years ago also mattered. So that how bad the inequality was in your past seems to affect your likelihood of dying now. The effects of violence have a haven't been looked at. It's hard to figure out how you could get a decent enough data set to do that right. But, but I don't think it's impossible. Okay, so so with regards to health effects, so I'm going to lay out a, an account of them and, and you can tell me what you think about this. All right, so uh, your, 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 your brain 
is always trying to calculate to some degree how good things are going for you. And that's an extraordinarily difficult calculation because life is uncertain and ultimately uncertain and it's difficult to predict the future except perhaps by using the past as a marker. And so you, what seems to happen is that our nervous and our nervous systems are always interested in how prepared we should be for emergency at any given moment. And as far as I can tell, there, there are a number of ways that we calibrate that. One is baseline levels of trait neuroticism. So that's sensitivity to anxiety and uncertainty and emotional pain. And so you seem to be born, roughly speaking, at, a, at, at, an, at your uh, average level of neuroticism, which can vary substantially between people. It can be also adjusted at puberty. And then the environment can move you in one direction or another. So, for example, if you have a highly anxious child and you encourage them to go out and explore, then you can move them towards the normal range. Uh, Jerry Kagan has demonstrated that quite nicely. Okay, so the first, the first estimate of how worried you should be about the future is like genetic roll of the dice. Some people will be born extraordinarily worried, roughly speaking, and some people will be born hardly worried at all, and then that can be modified by the, by the particulars of the social environment. Right. So then the next thing that seems to me to be part of the calculation is comparison. How well are you doing compared to others? Yeah. And that, that seems to be adjusted by mechanisms that associate perceived social status with serotonin, serotonergic activity, such okay. that as you move up a dominance hierarchy, your, your serotonin levels rise so that your impulsivity, which would be partly sensitive sensitivity to immediate reward, declines, and so does your sensitivity to negative emotion. Whereas if you plummet down to the bottom of a hierarchy, you start to become more reward-seeking and also more anxious. And the reason for that, more anxious, and is because the bottom of the dominance hierarchy actually is a more dangerous place to be because you don't have access to, you don't have reliable access as reliable to shelter or food or mating resources or health care. And you even see this in birds, you know. So if a, a flu sweeps through an avian population, it's the bedraggled birds at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy that die first. And so then, one more thing, and, and then, then I, I, tell me what you think about this, is that the other thing that seems to happen is that as you plummet down the dominance hierarchy and your mind settles into a more depressed and anxious state, the levels of cortisol that you produce chronically rise. And cortisol is a good hormone for activating you, but in, but in, but in high doses, high continual doses, it starts to produce brain damage, particularly in the hippocampus. And it also suppresses immunological function, which makes you more susceptible to infectious diseases. So that seems to be approximately the process. And so it's no wonder that people are trying to flee away from the bottom of the dominance hierarchy. Does that seem reasonable? Yes. Give me a, give me a moment. I've got a cough and blow my nose. Okay. hay fever season in southern Ontario. Uh -huh, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I wish I were a better behavioral endocrinologist and, uh, and knew a bit more, was more expert in some of the processes that you're talking about. But a lot of that makes sense to me. The, this fraught social comparisons, I mean, the evidence certainly is that it's more stressful to be low ranking than high ranking. We've had a little myth that, oh, Hot, being a very high rank puts all this burden of decision making on you and that's terribly stressful and makes you vulnerable to heart attack and blah 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 and the data say the opposite the data say that's not true the more power and status and if you like decision making authority you have the less vulnerable you seem to be to stress related diseases so you know yeah, well, a, lot of, a lot of what you're saying makes makes evident sense to me then the developmental story that you're telling I mean I, I, I think it's right that people I don't, I don't know how important the uh, throw of the genetic dice is. I think it's all an extremely interesting puzzle evolutionarily why there's as much heritable genetic variability in seemingly important domains as there is. And I'm not convinced anybody has, you know, really, really understands what modulates how much variability there is. But in any case, um, that things are adjustable in response to what you encounter and in and in response to 
social status, perceived um, social status in response to social comparisons, makes evident sense to me. And again, I, I, I don't know enough about um, the putative damaging effects of excessively prolonged exposure to, say, high cortisol levels to be sure whether there isn't still some adaptation, some actual functionality to the response to long-term exposure lurking beneath the seeming breakdown of the system. Because it just seems to me that sort of a Darwinian, non-evolutionary um, social scientists and psychiatrists and psychologists have been too quick to assume pathology when they see states of affairs that do indeed have damaging consequences, but may in some nevertheless um, have some utility. I, I, I wish I knew a little more about well, that. Well, I think both the low serotonin and the high cortisol levels are interesting in that regard, because what does happen is the combination of those two things makes you A, more impulsive, and B, more prepared for emergency action. Uh -huh. Both of those things are very useful in an uncertain environment. The, yes, the, detrimental, the detrimental consequences seem to occur as a consequence of prolonged overload is that because your body is utilizing, imagine that what your body is doing is utilizing more units of resource per moment of time yeah. because of the necessity for preparation for unexpected events and that can become physiologically exhausting in the long run. So I think it, it, it does, it, 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 it seems to me that those biochemical effects do underlie the sort of adaptive responses that you describe, except that, you know, too much is too much. And yeah. if it's hard to live at the bottom, what that means is you age faster and you don't live as long and you also have higher susceptibility to disease. And maybe in some sense that's the price you pay for the adaptive impulsivity that's also necessary to give you a chance to shoot back up the hierarchy if, if that's the sort of thing that you're looking for. Yeah, no, and I, I can't help thinking about sort of the evolutionary theories of uh, of senescence and bodily repair that uh, that were pioneered by Sir Peter Benamor back in the fifties and developed more by George Williams. The idea that um, many many things involve some sort of trade off between expenditure for expenditure of energy of accumulated resources of capacity in the pursuit of something now at the expense of reduced capacity to be successful later. Um, and, and so, you know, one reason why these chronic states may have long-term um, damaging effects is because selection against being in these chronic states has not been strong because those who are in them for a long time didn't historically tend to live very long anyway, and they're they're being, if you like, motivated or prepared to engage in high risk activities that at least have some chance of short term payoff, which is more or less what you said mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, you talked about this miss, let's call it a misbegotten idea that there's stress at the top of the dominance hierarchy, just like there is stress at the bottom, and that the stress at the top is responsibility and decision making and all of that, and you know. I, I do believe that there's truth in that, but there's an important, another important biological element that needs to be considered. And so there's, a, there's plenty of work done in the domains of clinical psychology, and, and, and some of this is psychophysiological and neurophysiological for that matter, showing that a stress of an equivalent magnitude has fewer negative effects if it's taken on voluntarily. Uh -huh. So, because what happens? What happens yes. is that if you voluntarily engage in the stressful activity, your approach systems are activated rather than your defense systems, and the approach systems are associated with positive emotion, and with and with much, and whereas the negative emotions are associated with this defensive posturing that includes preparation for emergency, and that's much more physiologically damaging. And so, whether something, whether you pick up a load voluntarily or have it thrust upon you seems to make a big difference to how heavy it is. And that's a, that's very, that's a very interesting piece of uh, set of, of research studies as far as I'm concerned. It's quite fascinating that that can be the case. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you another question. Let's get down to, we might say, brass tacks here. So we can make a case that inequality 
destabilizes societies and 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 cranks up the male on male homicide rate and and the destabilization occurs because young men become more and more unpredictable and violent and so you could make a conservative case as well as a liberal case for not having a society that takes inequality to an extreme because conservatives at least in principle should be concerned with the maintenance of social stability over the long run so but but Okay, and so then you might make a case for income redistribution, but that gets very, very troublesome because it's not that easy to redistribute income. And, and that's what I want to talk to you about. So, you know, we're in a situation, of course, where the top 1% of the population uh, controls a substantial proportion of the economic resources. And the top 1% of that top 1% controls the bulk of that. Now, I've looked into that quite deeply, and that, that distribution... And is it's not a normal distribution of money. It's a Pareto yeah. distribution of money. But the weird thing about Pareto distributions, and so that's a distribution where many, many people end up with zero and you know just a few people end up with a lot, is that a Pareto distribution characterizes zero-sum games that are played out to their conclusion. So like Monopoly, everybody starts in the middle, but then random trading produces an eventual Pareto-shaped distribution where Lots of people start to stack up on the loser side. One person accelerates towards victory until finally everyone's at zero except one person. So it's the logical outcome of a random trading game. So that's the first thing that's interesting about the Pareto distribution. The second thing that's interesting is that Pareto distributions, um, they, Pareto distributions emerge in every domain of creative human production, not just the distribution of money. So for example, we did an analysis of the of creative achievement across the lifespan using right. a, uh, using a, a, an instrument called the Creative Achievement Questionnaire. And so what it did was assess people's levels of competence across thirteen potential domains of creative activity. And so we okay. were looking at production rather than creative thinking per se, right? right? Although those two things are related and quite tightly, we wanted to know who actually accomplished things in the world. And so. For musical ability, for example, the zero score would be I have no training or, or talent in this area. And the maximum score would be, you know, my, my, comp my original compositions have been played for international audiences. And so we've now administered that to, hun to hundreds of people, and the median score is zero across all 13 domains. It's a very, very uh, precise Pareto distribution with a few people who are the outliers producing the overwhelming majority of the goods and you also and that there's a there's also a law that De Sola Price uh, came up with back in the 1960s governing the output of scientific papers and he found that the square root of the number of people operating within an academic domain produced half the papers that were published in that domain right so so that's not so bad if there's 10 researchers because then three of them are producing half the papers. But if there's a thousand researchers operating in a domain, then 30 of them are producing half the papers. Okay, so and then one more complication, and then I'm, I'm going to let you, let you have at this. So I've been looking for, now you can think that the Pareto distribution, which by the way characterizes the distribution of wealth in every known society, although the degree to which the distribution is skewed, differs. You can say that the Pareto distribution is a consequence of the, of the final playing out of a random trading game. But then here's the complication. This is something that's been, you know, bothering me for years. There are predictors of long-term life success in, in relatively stable societies. And uh -huh. the best predictors are in, in this order. The first predictor is IQ. The second predictor is trait conscientiousness, and it's about half as powerful as IQ. And the third predictor is low neuroticism, and it's about half as powerful as conscientiousness. So if you get a good measure of IQ and a good measure of conscientiousness, then you can predict about 25% of the variance in performance, especially across managerial, administrative, and academic domains. And then with regards to entrepreneurial performance, you can use IQ and, and trait openness, which is the creativity measure. So there are powerful individual differences that are driving differential performance and also driving this Pareto distribution. And so it's not merely a random game, although how these people manage to make it into not a random game is beyond me. 
but there is evidence that that our society does hierarchically arrange itself at least to some degree by ability and competence and so then the the question is how do you factor that into the equation when you're thinking about practical let's call them income I don't think it's so much income re redistribution is that it's an attempt by society to stop too many people from stacking up at zero and, and therefore logically turning to violence and that sort of thing as an alternative. Well, as well as an attempt to just um, Im improve the level of justice in society. The idea, you know, I mean, especially if there's an element, a strong element of randomness and who ends up where, then there's something unjust about large numbers being stuck down at the zero. But, uh, you know, you say, how is it possible to redistribute? But countries vary in the extent to which they do this. They vary in the extent to which they tax inheritance. They value, vary in the extent to which they tax large incomes. Um, they vary in the extent to which they provide education and health care, try and provide it relatively uh, universally, try and make opportunity relatively universal. They vary in these things. And, you know, some of the happiest countries in the world, and I think the most productive countries in the world, um, the Nordic countries, Japan, have been relatively equitable um, because they rig this game more than some other countries, if you like. Uh, so, you know, you say that uh, what stacks up at the top tend to be the most competent and creative people, and to imply that to some degree we have a meritocracy. And to some degree we do have a meritocracy. But, you know, the four Walmart heirs have as much wealth as the 100 million poorest Americans put together. And they did nothing to earn it. Um, you could say, well, they're high quality people because they got half their genes from Sam Walton and he did something to earn it. Um, that seems like a pretty weak argument for why they should control that much wealth. If, if inheritance were more severely taxed in order to provide public goods for everybody, would the society be worse off? Would um, flattening out that curve of accomplishment actually reduce productivity? You know, I think there's some, there, I think there's some evidence, I wish I could pull it to the forefront of my mind, about the utility of distributing grant money um, more or less equitably in certain sciences. And the, the amount of science you get for your buck um, is better when you give lots and lots of people relatively small grants than when you give a small number of people relatively large grants. Yeah, well, uh, that's that's interesting because I've worked in the grant system in the U.S. and in Canada, and the grant system in the U.S. is more of the give a few people a huge amount of money for variety, and in Canada it's distributed more equitably. And I must say that I vastly prefer the Canadian system. Now, I, I agree with you, and I think the Canadian system has been moving regrettably in the direction of the American. I mean, it partly depends on the field of science, of course. If you need a bloody hadron collider, then you need millions and millions of dollars. If you're um, a psychologist like you or me, um, things seem to work better in many ways when you fund a higher proportion of grants with a, with a lower variance in the, uh, in the amount yeah. awarded. When I first came to McMaster, there was exactly... Oh, no, I shouldn't say when I first came, by, by say, let's say the late 80s um, and early 90s, essentially everybody in the department had a research grant from either NSERC, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, or SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, usually the former in our particular department. Everybody in the department had an active research lab. Everybody created the opportunity for two or three students to do a bachelor's thesis in their lab each year. Then when things get more variable, people start people people who are being productive, who are getting out a scientific paper or two, doing decent work, making a contribution to knowledge. When they start being denied these grants, you know, when you refuse two or three times in the competition and say, well, the hell with it, you know, I mean, um, I've got tenure, I've got a good pension lined up, I think I'll become a real estate speculator. The opportunities for the dissemination of research opportunity to a larger number of students shrink. Um, I think it's it's been a disaster in certain mm -hmm. areas. And you know, an area where I was raised, animal behavior studies. If you just look at either the number of papers in top ranked journals um, by country, according to how they allocate their funds or how much money is allocated to it, 
the money allocated to it is a less strong predictor than you'd expect, and the equitability is a stronger predictor. Mm -hmm. Sweden and Canada um, used to, last time I looked, both rank far above the United States in numbers of papers per capita getting into top quality research journals in animal behavior. You know, okay, it's, it's one little anecdote in a way, but... Uh, but I would be very surprised if there isn't some generality to this phenomenon. Well, I, I wonder, though, um, to play devil's advocate, the, the thing about distributing research funds more equitably is that you are distributing them among a population that's already been extraordinarily highly selected for capability. True, true. And so it seems counterproductive because it's, for, for all the flaws of the university system, which are manifold, it is still extraordinarily difficult to become a professor. It's a, it's a multi-tiered selection system. And so the people who do become professors are on average very intelligent and on average very hardworking. And we know that because we know what the predictors are of success in academia and its intelligence and conscientiousness, unsurprisingly, although creativity seems to play almost zero role. Really? But the, well, the thing, yeah, well, but that's partly because, you know, science is an algorithmic game, right? And just beetling away at it busily is a very, very powerful mechanism. So I, I'm not the least bit cynical about that. I mean, the reason that science works is because it's, it, in some sense, it has the aspect of factory production. It can be distributed. Anyone can learn to do it. And you get a long ways by nibbling at the edges. You know, it's yep. continual, yep. continual slow progress when millions of people are doing it is progress that's plenty rapid. So, okay, so, so there are definitely situations in which denying people resources seems to be completely counterproductive, and that would be one of them. So, now the, the, the other question though is, I would say, and, and also that's the thing, there's also an effective means of funneling resources to, let's say, a wide range of professors. It yes. actually works. The problem, one of the problems with general income redistribution is, as far as I can tell, is that we don't really know how to do it very well. And one of the, th I mean, look, here, here's an example. You can tell me what you think about this. So I used to work, I used to live in northern Alberta when the oil, sporadic oil booms were going on. And my observation was that if you wanted to make money in Alberta when an oil boom was going on, you didn't go out and work on the rigs. Although if you did that, you could make a tremendous amount of money. Now, it was all young men who did that, pretty much, say, between the ages of 16 and 25, something like that. And they were making fantastic amounts of money. But they, uh, virtually, almost all of them came out of it with nothing to show for it. Because they would work for two weeks and then go into town and just have a blowout party for four days and spend everything they got and buy expensive cars and wreck them and so forth. So it was reckless behavior um, that I think was akin in some sense to that, to that, uh, to the, to the steep dominance hierarchy, violence, and, and that sort of thing that for status seeking that you're describing, the people who really made money were the bartenders, right? Because they, they, they absorbed all the, all the excess profits and actually generally, generally speaking or comparatively speaking, were able to utilize the money properly. Now, the point I'm making is that an oil boom is a very effective way of distributing wealth down the economic ladder but it didn't necessarily seem to me to be a very effective one because it didn't because the money flowed back up to the top 1% damn near as fast as you could shovel it downwards and that's that's the thing about that damn pareto distribution is that it's it seems there are people there's a there's a there's a group there's a scientific subfield called econophysicists and they actually they actually model the distribution of money in an economy using the same equations that model the distribution of a gas into a vacuum. So, so there's something that's natural law-like about this. The, the economists call it the Matthew principle, right? To those who have everything, more will be given. And from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. And I don't think that we've done a good job of grappling with the actual complexity of this. And we tend to split up into politically opposed, uh, what would you call, camps and argue about the the solution to inequality and the left-wing solution is something like you know distribute the money take it from the rich especially the undeserving rich if you can identify them and give it to the poor and the conservatives say well no the poor should the poor should bootstrap themselves up and maybe be provided with more opportunity and that might equalize things but it isn't clear to me that we're actually grappling with the magnitude of the problem no it isn't clear to me either but what you say about 
equalizing opportunity, for example, is in a sense e distributing the resources because one way you equalize opportunity is by having universal high quality health care that's paid for by some sort of government revenue, some taxes picked up somewhere. Um, free education um, and universal access to education is certainly another and it's you know it's another way that in effect you create a more egalitarian society so i mean there are there are certain domains certainly education and healthcare maybe some others that are not springing to mind well i suppose the improvement of various sorts of infra infrastructure mm -hmm. that you know make it easier to get from point a to point b um you know, yeah, so that's, that's pub publicly subsidized trends and things like that can certainly be contributors as well. Now, that's equalizing in its own right. You're not mm -hmm. taking it from anybody and giving it specifically to anybody else. Then there's things like a guaranteed minimum income. And at first, it sounds like a crazy idea the idea that, you know, you should just, um, we should take government accrued resources, which come from some sort of taxation, and we should just make sure everybody has 15,000 bucks a year to start or something like that. Um, it sounds kind of wacky because the, the standard argument against it from the right has been that it will undermine incentives and nobody will produce bugger all if, you know, if we could all be welfare right, queens. Right. But we we'll want to be welfare queens, mostly. And where this stuff has been tried, my understanding is that that it's been surprisingly successful, that there was an experiment in Manitoba where um, a minimum income was tried for a while where? And, gosh. Yeah, I remember not, that. I, and I know exactly. I think Finland's By about a, to try it. Finland's about to try it. Manitoba has tried it. It was an NDP government, I think, which then was replaced by a conservative or, or nominally liberal government. Um, then sort of canned the results, but the results came to light later and showed that, for example, the number of people who chose not to work did not go up under this, um, and that it had various beneficial effects. I think it remains to be seen, but I think even the idea of putting money in the hands of everybody from the great collective wealth that has accumulated could be socially beneficial, could be economically beneficial, could be environmentally beneficial. Um, See, I and wonder, the, I wonder. And, and, and that certainly in the domains like education and health care, that's in effect a kind of redistribution right. that, uh, that seems easy to effectuate. I mean, easy, if not easy to effectuate in terms of convincing people politically or, or overcoming the propaganda against it. But yeah, we know how. A whole bunch of, obviously, a whole bunch of, of our wealth is embodied in the infrastructure. Yes. So I really noticed this, for example, when I lived in Montreal, because Montreal is a great city. And one of the things that distinguishes Montreal from most cities that I've lived in, uh, especially Western cities, is that people live in the city. They don't live in their houses. Yes. And the fact that the city is extraordinarily livable, so you can walk everywhere, there's always something to do that's exciting. There's a tremendously active street life, means that there's access to infrastructure and social capital related wealth just distributed everywhere. And that, yes. that's a lovely thing. Um, so, Kaz, I'm kind of looking for solutions to the Pareto distribution problem that conservatives and liberals alike could agree upon. And so some of those you outlined improve the infrastructure of our society because that, those are public goods that benefit everyone that also improve productivity. There seems to be no downside to that at all. Also raises employment, improve yep. the quality of education right from, right, right from day one, which is something that I think we do a very bad job of. Um, uh, and then the issue with healthcare, it's my understanding that the Canadian healthcare system for it, and it has flaws, um, be, because it's of course dealing with an impossible problem, um, still uses much less of its capital on maintaining itself and, for example, um, having to maintain an infrastructure that, that collects money. I know that the hospitals in the U.S. spend something, some substantial proportion of the revenue, I, I can't remember precisely, but it's between 17 and 30 percent, if I remember correctly, just gathering the money for their services, which seems to be a rather counterproductive use of the resources. And so, I wonder how much is spent on billboards advertising their hospitals, too. If you drive the interstate highways of the U.S., it's astonishing how much um, information about 
you know, come to such and such where we have the best cancer yeah. doctors, well, and, etc. And, and, and it isn't well, and the and Americans pay a lot for their health care. They and, do indeed. They yeah. do indeed. I spent three years there yeah. recently, and uh, we paid a lot for health care coverage that turned out not, in fact, to be all that thorough a coverage. Right. Well, and when I lived in the States, too, and I had decent coverage, I, I, I was teaching in Boston there, I had a pretty good program, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was manifestly different from the, my Canadian experience, which has been mixed, but of course, it is very important to note that he, the, that making people healthy is impossible because everybody gets sick and ages and dies and so it's an impossible task and it also indicates to me that that's perhaps one of the reasons why it doesn't fit so nicely into a free market model because the free market assumes that there's not infinite demand for something and there is actually near infinite demand for health care especially yeah, no, when you're dying there's that and there's also just you know it's it's an impossible problem because of an aging population it's an impossible problem because, you know, governments have one of the determinants of the costs of the healthcare system is how many MDs you've got out there billing it. And governments have a tendency to want to respond to this by restricting the number of new medics um, so as to restrict the number of people billing. But this is not much of a solution when you have large numbers of people trying to find a family doctor unsuccessfully. Okay, so there is there is some meritocratic structure to our society insofar as IQ, conscientiousness, and openness predict long-term life success. And that's a good thing because that's an indicator of, of health in a society. I would say it's, it's if your society is set up to, to, to allow people who are intelligent and conscientious nearer the pinnacles of power structures, that's a good thing for everyone. Now, you could still have an argument about how steep that gradient should be. But then with regards to the to the guaranteed annual income issue, uh, I'm also concerned that the importance of individual differences there are not being considered. So for example, I don't know what people who are extremely low in conscientiousness would do with an annual income because yeah. they're, they're not inclined to work and it isn't obvious to me that providing them with an easy way out is the answer because providing unconscientious people with an easy way out seems to be actually quite counterproductive. And conscientiousness is, a, you know, it's a decent predictor of long-term success. And we also yeah. don't know to what degree necessity is a motivator, which is, of course, the conservative argument. So, so and we also don't know how homogenous and small a society has to be before income redistribution programs will actually be successful. It seems easier to implement them in relatively homogenous societies like the Scandinavian countries or the or, or Japan, which is where they tend to have been implemented with more success. So that's a comp complicated phenomena as well. And then the other thing that's that's really going to come up on us hard in the next ten years, I would say, this is how it looks to me, is that I think computational devices are a multiplier of intelligence and conscientiousness, because. If you're smart and you know how to use a computer, and, and you're diligent, so as a conscientious person would be, then you're much more deadly than you would be without your computer, because it multiplies your... And there's a huge difference between someone who really knows how to use a computer, including knowing how to program it, and someone who's you know literate enough to use their iPad to, to do a Google search. And so I think yeah. one of the things that's also driving inequality, particularly in societies like the United States, is that increasingly people who are smart and conscientious can do a t tremendous amount of work without having to hire anyone. So we have these tiny companies that employ almost no one that, that gather massive resources to yeah. themselves. And that's going to be a problem. Well, here's a good example. Here's one thing that's coming. So, you know, the Tesla guys are working pretty hard on autonomous vehicles. And they're yep. making a lot of progress, and they're not the only ones, obviously. But, you know, the biggest employer for males in North America is as driver. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, huh? yeah. It's the biggest single employment category. So, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. we're, 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 we're increasingly eradicating the possibility for people who are on the lower end of the intelligence distribution and the lower end of the conscientiousness distribution to find a place in society. And it, it's possible that providing them with, with minimal resources to survive might be sufficient to solve that problem, but I doubt it because, as they say, you know, man does not live on bread alone, 
and it seems to me that people need that quest the degree to which people need to find a productive and credible place in a functional yes. society is something that we haven't yet we don't know the parameters of that no no i i i don't disagree i mean the the uh of course the loss of decently paid work um antedates the major computer revolution to some extent or at least the uh the you know modern electronic device and and your phone could do everything revolution and you know i live in hamilton ontario where where formerly a lunch bucket town with uh with an enormous number of people working in decently paid um, working class jobs and those jobs have been evaporating and if drivers evaporate well, I mean, work is going to change work opportunities are going to change and I, I take your point that people need something that they can think of as useful work um useful work you know it's interesting we're talking we're two males talking about this and we're probably thinking from a somewhat male perspective there's a lot of useful work that is minimally or not at all comp compensated that have been predominantly female domains um daycare kinds of things uh, various so-called charitable activities and so on and you know the the idea that people need something to occupy their time with that feels worthwhile that enters them into a social arena where they engage with other people that they come home satisfied that they've done something useful and they also you know have a chicken in every pot besides i mean if work opportunities shrink and if the next mark zuckerberg can employ a hundred people to pull in um tens of billions of dollars then where's that going to come from it's, it may come from various sorts of unpaid work with a guaranteed income that you know enables that work to be unpaid and still be fulfilling maybe, yeah, well, i don't maybe, know maybe, well, i don't know well that's a good thing to think about i mean maybe maybe people will learn how to go out into the community and spontaneously do useful things although i can tell you that my experience trying to find gainful uh, let's call it volunteer employments for people who are on the lower end of the ability distribution has been absolutely uh, it's it's difficult beyond imagination because it turns out that finding a volunteer position is actually no less difficult than finding a job for example you have to go through a relatively complicated process of police right. screening for most jobs and you have to produce a resume and you have to be able to work in an office environment and you know you need to have all the abilities that you would have if you were actually having yeah. a real job and and so that that makes things complicated as well so yeah, no, I, I want to come back also to what you were saying about um, the predictive power of IQ and conscientiousness, which I don't dispute. And I'm also not one of these people who suffers under the delusion that these things are totally, open quotes, socially determined, close quotes. I mean, I understand and believe that they have high heritability and identifiable genetic um, sources in that variability and so on. But, you know, the standard old joke used to be, you can tell me because you know more about personality psychology than I do, the standard old joke used to be that everything's 50% heritable, that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that pretty much anything that you can measure as a trait that has any stability within the lifetime also turns out to have a heritability somewhere near 0.5. But there's the other 0.5. Um, you know, some people have low IQs because they were exposed to too much lead and infancy. Um, yeah. You know, um, I believe that conscientiousness can probably be, um, well, I, I believe you suggested earlier that we know something about this already, about developmental determinants of, of shifts in conscientiousness. And uh, so, you know, we have to caution ourselves against talking about these individual difference factors as if they are immutable attributes of individuals that are going to um, undermine any sort of progressive improvement of of yeah, circumstances well, for people are 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 are, are going to create bad byproducts of attempts to produce social justice it's just gonna you know you're gonna leave your your dumb unconscientious people out there being parasites or something well you know um there there is of course decent evidence that that, that there are sociocultural effects on iq i mean the flynn effect which is named after the man who who described the 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 phenomena indicates that 
the average IQ has been increasing quite substantially over the last hundred years. And the reason for that, no one knows for sure, but one of the putative reasons for that is that we've lifted the bottom out of catastrophe. So yeah. there aren't people whose IQs are stunted by, by uh, exposure to zero information during critical developmental periods and who didn't get enough to eat. Yeah, so I was going to say severe malnutrition, never right. by zero information, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So we've, we've wiped out, in, in many ways, we've wiped out the worst effects of privation. And that's increasingly true as well on, on the worldwide scale, worldwide yeah. uh, stage. You know, there's about 150,000 people a day right now being lifted out of absolute poverty by UN standards, the fastest improvement in the history of the world by a huge margin, and also about 300,000 people a day being hooked up to the electrical grid. So we are making some progress removing the absolute privation problem, which is a non-trivial yes. problem. The problem with most of the attempts to raise IQ is that they don't change the variance in IQ. They tend to raise the average IQ across the population. And that leaves the inequality, IQ inequality problem basically untouched. So there have been studies trying to estimate how much socioeconomic um, pressure, let's say, you have to place on an individual to raise their IQ. Lowering it's easy, right? Because making yeah. something worse is always easier than making something better. But yeah. if I remember correctly, if you take a, an identical twin who's adopted out at birth, in order to produce a 15-point increase in IQ compared to the other twin, which is a one standard deviation increase, and about the same as the average difference between a university student in an in a average state college and an average high school student, you have to move the one twin from the fifth percentile of socioeconomic status to the 95th percentile. So you need about a three standard deviation improvement in socioeconomic conditions to produce a one standard deviation improvement in IQ. So it looks like it can be done, but it's but it's expensive, you know. And, and yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. I'm kind of surprised, um, actually. I mean, given you know, we just mentioned malnutrition as one possible source of low IQ, one possible developmental source. I'm kind of surprised that. Uh, to the degree that the Flynn effect might be due to things like a reduction of the number of people exposed to severe malnutrition, that it wouldn't have also simultaneously truncated the variance a little bit. Um, that seems slightly surprising. Well, it has truncated. Sorry, let, let me restate that. It has truncated. It has truncated the variance, although the data on that isn't clear, isn't as clear. Uh -huh. So, but but I, I do believe that it's a reasonable inference to make that the variance has been truncated. It's also hidden to some degree because the IQ tests are always renormed to keep the variance at a standard 15 points. Yes. So, so it makes it difficult to look retrospectively and see what's happened to the variance. So, but uh, the other problem too is that you know you get these stories now and then about these companies that come out with claims that their brain exercises can improve IQ, and the literature on that is damn dismal. I can tell you, it's that the holy grail is to produce cognitive exercises that produce a legitimate impact on fluid intelligence and and like there's been a lot of work done on that and the answer so far is that it doesn't work so what about so, the what about the video gaming i mean i know there has been the suggestion that playing video games actually improves at least some aspects of intelligence yeah well there's a couple of studies that indicated that video games might improve spatial intelligence but but yeah. here's the problem and and i think this is this is a critical problem and perhaps an insoluble one, or at least no one solved it, is that what you get is that if you, if you exercise yourself substantially on a given game, you can radically accelerate your performance in the game. So you can get much better at those specific skills, sure. but you don't get generalization across cognitive sets which is what you're really hoping for. Because yeah, I, I, thought, I thought that was the claim from some of these. Yeah, well, they, they have shown some increases in spatial IQ, but there's not very many studies, and I would say they're far overbalanced by the other side of the yeah. research equation, which continually says, and I've looked at this because I'm really interested in the improvement of IQ. I mean, that's, that's the holy grail in some sense, and that, and, and uh, the, 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 overwhelming preponderance of evidence suggests that you don't get generalization outside the narrow domain. Now okay. why that is, and even this, it's even worse, hey, because you might say, well, imagine that you could take five different domains of intelligence still associated tightly with, with G, and you had people practice 
routines in all five dimensions, maybe you'd get generalization under those circumstances and the, 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 the results of the research attempting that indicate that no, as soon as you move away from those specific practice instances, you don't get generalization. So, I, mean, I, guess in, I guess in some ways, some of this is to be expected from the consideration that everything is an allocation problem within, within the body and brain and, um, that, you know, by and large, an improvement in one domain tends to be bought at the expense of something else. Uh, you know, you, yeah, just that. Right. And then conscientiousness. I can tell you some research we've done that's cool. Although we haven't been able to demonstrate that it's actually improved conscientiousness. The first thing to note about conscientiousness is that no one understands it at all. Especially the industriousness element. There's no plausible biological, psychological, neurophysiological or animal models for conscientiousness. All we've got is self-reports. We can't even find tasks that conscientious people do better. It's, it's unbelievable. But... Um, Ooh, well, self-reports, really? Self-report. Well, you can get reports from teachers and parents and so forth, but it's all human report. Okay. It's the only okay. way we can measure it. And we, you know, like in my lab, we probably tried 200 tasks trying to find something that conscientiousness, conscientious people do better. No luck. We can derive it from linguistic analysis of verbal output now to some degree, but that's still, that's not a task, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Now, we, we produced a series of programs um, called the Self-Authoring Suite, and one of them, the Future Authoring Program, it's a writing program that helps people lay out their plans for the future in, in detail. So they have to consider their, um, their intimate relationships, their career goals, their educational goals, their use of time outside work, their plans to maintain mental and physical health, their use of drugs and alcohol. They have to write for 15 minutes about what kind of life they'd like to have if they were taking care of themselves three to five years in the future. And then to write for the same amount of time about how terrible their life could be if all their bad habits took control. Okay. And then they have to turn the positive vision into an implementable plan. We've managed to improve their college grades by about 20% and drop, out their drop, drop their dropout rate by about 25% over about 10,000 students now. But, you know, we tried to see if that was mediated by an improvement in conscientiousness, and there was no evidence for that. Uh, what it was mediated by was number of words written during the exercise. So it turns uh -huh. out that thinking more about your future helps. The more you think about it, the more it helps. And maybe that, you know, maybe that would translate into an improvement in conscientiousness across time, but um, there haven't been any credible studies that I know of indicating that there are exercises that can be done to improve conscientiousness. So that's also, you know, troublesome and, and worrisome because that would be a nice thing to be able to do. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought much about, and I don't know much about the literature on conscientiousness as a trait, but the word seems to connote to me as an ordinary English speaker has a strong social element to it as well. It's kind of like a conscientious person is somebody who doesn't forget his obligations. Um, your index of conscientiousness in a university professor is, you know, somebody has asked you to write them a reference letter for getting into graduate school or whatever. Do you actually prioritize and get the damn thing done on time or is there some risk that you'll just forget about it and shove it to the, yeah. somewhere else? Um, I, I, I imagine conscientiousness is having a strong element of, of attentiveness to social obligation and to the well-being of others. Do, as it is defined in the personality literature, does it have any of that? Well, I would, I would say not so much attention to the well-being of others, because that's more trait agreeableness. Okay. That's more the maternal dimension. But there's definitely a massive effect of social obligation, which is part of the reason why conservatives tend to be higher in conscientiousness than liberals. But it's not well-being of others, it's duty. And so the, the, the conscientious types may form and maintain social contracts. Yes. They implement their plans. Yeah. And they seem to feel shame and self-contempt when they, when they fail to live up to their social obligations. And so yeah. that's another thing that's interesting about the income redistribution idea, because it's conceivable to me that conscientious people would hate that, because Conscientious people do very badly, for example, if they're, un if they're laid off from work, even if it's not their fault, they still take themselves apart for their failure. Uh -huh. and, so, and so conscientious people in, in particular seem to find inactivity 
without productivity, highly aversive, and aversive enough to really cause them, you know, major health problems. So, well, yeah, that that brings us back to what we were discussing a little while ago: the problem of um, ensuring that large numbers of people have access to meaningful work in an age in which it is more and more the case that uh, that big components of the economy um, are booming away with very few employees. And, that, and that's going to continue. That's probably going to escalate. Um, we're back to that same topic to some extent. Yes. Well, I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. And yeah. again, I, I mean, I think, I think inequality of opportunity is sort of the bottom or bedrock of inequality having its impacts upon us. And it's, it's, it's certainly the bottom of bedrock of, of why we should care about it on moral and social justice grounds. It's like, well, why should people who, why should one's birthright affect the opportunities available to one? And well, it's also a social catastrophe because, uh, hypothetically, you want to set up a society so that whatever someone has to offer is maximally offerable to the community because otherwise the community yes. loses. Yes. And that seems to be, I mean, I think one of the great examples of that, although I don't think this accounts for all of it, is that the relationship between the provision of women's rights by countries and their economic productivity is staggeringly high. So I think that also has to do with open openness in general to transformation yeah. and change with 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 the provision of women's rights being an index of that but nonetheless it's a great predictor of eventual economic success well so, par partly an index and partly perhaps a more more direct effect that after all slightly over half the population um, maybe their talents are better utilized um, right well that's certainly what we would hope and, and yeah. I think, I think, as you said, I think the evidence at least suggests that. Yeah. So, okay, so let me recapitulate because we should probably fold this up. It's, and so, so, as far as I'm concerned, your work was revolutionary because it undermined the general proposition that the fundamental cause of crime and vi violent crime in particular was poverty. Instead, you, you, flipped it, you flipped it on edge, so to speak, and made the, made the claim well substantiated by the research that it's relative poverty that drives violent crime because of status seeking primarily among young men and okay. that although there are effects of pro absolute privation and that would be the poverty effect the the effects of relative deprivation of status are much more let's say especially in our societies much more socially significant yes and that the status competition itself is driven at least in part by the desire of men to attain status, to obtain access to, to women, roughly speaking. And it's partly because women outsource the problem of mate selection to the male competition domain, right? So the males compete, the women peel off the top. It's like a market solution in some sense. And then, and then having pointed out that inequality not only drives male homicide, but also tends to destabilize societies, there is an impetus for people to consider how we can stop the winner from taking all without becoming unduly authoritarian about it or, or, or impeding individual productivity given the fact that there is individual variation in, yes. in the elements that actually produce productivity. That's our set of social problems exacerbated by the fact that we're going to be wiping out employment for huge categories, per, particularly of men, over the next 15 years. Yeah, uh, let me, uh, in this context, uh, just make a point that I spent most of a chapter of my book on, and that is that the notion that inequality is somehow um, the engine of productivity has been pretty much rejected by economists themselves in recent years. They've come to the conclusion that relatively equitable places actually have more um, economic productivity in the ensuing period of time than those that start out more inequitable. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, the one that I think is most striking that I would commend people to look into is the concept of useless, if you like, or wasteful expenditure on guard labor in relatively unequal societies. And guard labor is a term coined by 
the economist Sam Bowles and Arjun Jayadev. And what they've shown is that the number of people who are employed in just jobs like being security guards um, goes up as inequality goes up. It's no great surprise when you think about it. But you could define guard labor more broadly or more narrowly. And the general result is that a large proportion of people are engaged in work that is, in a sense, non-productive. It's just trying mm -hmm. to prevent people from usurping the property of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and that this is a very wasteful consequence of extreme inequality and, and, and uh, economic waste that's reduced in relatively equitable societies. And mm -hmm. there are others. Um, right. another so one, as, the, as the society becomes more unequal, it tilts towards authoritarianism at multiple levels of organization. It's well, also just counter... A, yeah, sorry, I was just going to say, and towards, exactly, it's, and it's counterproductive even from the point of view of, of simple, you know, economic criteria of GDP and so on, that, uh, that inequality gets in the way of that for a bunch of reasons. Another really interesting one that Bowles has, um, has articulated in, in a recent book, Bowles, B-O-W-L-E-S, Sam Bowles, if people want to look him up, um, I think his book was called um, the new politics of inequality and redistribution, and I liked it a lot. Um, anyway, what, one thing that he's shown that I thought was very interesting and had never entered my head before I read him was that the actual quality of goods in a society can be damaged by severe inequality when rich individuals and rich firms have the capacity to keep innovators and small companies from establishing themselves. You mentioned before about um, the differences in entrepreneurial undertakings. And where large numbers of people with worthy small business plans can't capitalize them properly and can't get off the ground, you've actually got the phenomenon of people with lots of wealth and shoddy products can drive people with better quality products who are trying to get started at the bottom out of the market yeah. with, with negative results for just the consumers right well of that's the, society. the problem with having people stack up at zero zero turns out to be a very very difficult place to get out of because yeah. you, you can't leverage yourself out of it but now it's can't. also in those really unequal societies too like say central american societies it's also becomes increasingly unpleasant for the people who are wealthy because they're only wealthy in a very narrowly defined way because they can't go outside they can't yeah. let their children go out on the into public because they'll get kidnapped i mean the societies get pretty ugly when the fences have to be really high, and yes. and and so so yeah. So and about, and among the rich countries, the, among the rich countries of the world, those problems are not absent. I mean, they're certainly worse in the U.S. than they are in Canada or most of Western Europe. Yeah. Well, all right, that was really good. I'm I'm very happy that you agreed to do a podcast with me, and and I mean, I found your work. Well, I'm, I definitely regard you as one of the people who's been highly influential on my thinking. I mean, I think that work on relative poverty is just, and, and the effect size is the work you guys did in Chicago, your work on indicating the, the adaptive utility of, of uncertainty-related dominance challenges in, in unequal societies, all of that's brilliant, I think, and nicely biologically predicated and the science is done extremely soundly and it has remarkable policy implications and you know and it changes the view around crime and 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 wealth and in a very important way to tilt it over towards the inequality side I think it's and it fits so nicely in with the dominance hierarchy literature and all of that it's it's really profound stuff as far as I'm concerned so I'm really glad you had a chance to share it with everyone Thank you very much. I appreciate those kind words. You can flattery will get you everywhere. <laughs> yeah, well, the thing is, the best kind of flattery is truth. So, and uh, I would certainly recommend that people take a look at your book if they're interested in what we've been discussing. Again, that's killing the competition, which is it's very readable. I would say it provides a lovely argument with regards to inequality, it addresses the major criticisms I think very effectively, and and starts to lay out what is going to be an increasingly necessary public discussion about how civilized societies can 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 ensure that they don't collapse into two extreme distribution um, uh, into two extreme distributions of wealth or other resources it's a real danger it's a con conscious constant danger it needs to be thought through and addressed very intelligently so 
thanks again. Hopefully, maybe we'll get another chance to talk. Hopefully, a couple of hundred thousand people will watch this. That would be good. <laughs> that would be great. Thanks a lot. You bet. Bye -bye. Signing off? Signing off. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye now.